Car sales rocketed upwards in December. 2013 could be even better. And what the hell is that rusted out car out in the middle of the woods all about? Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone. Your journey, our passion. This is Auto Line After Hours with John McElroy, episode 177 for January 4th. 2013 forecast cars are set to soar. Watch Autoline After Hours live at Autoline.tv every Thursday at 6 p.m. Eastern Time or 2300 GMT. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for Autoline in iTunes, Stitcher, or by following the links on our website. Peter DeLorenzo. Dude, we're, we're starting a whole nother year here, man. I know. This is pretty cool. I know. You have a good uh, time off? The holidays and all were good? Or? It was just a blur. No, it was fine. <laughs> and we should also welcome Edward Lapham <clears throat> from Automotive News. Thanks for joining us here today. And it's good to be here. Good to have you. And you, you have a good holiday? We did. We had a great holiday. Spent time with the kids, spent time alone after that. So it was wonderful. Cool. Well, uh, Peter, you got any New Year's resolutions? Not for you, for the auto industry. What should the auto industry be resolving to do this year? Um, Stop telegraphing what they're going to show us and just show the stuff. I can't stand this long, drawn-out tease, this, that, you know. And a perfect example is what they've done with the Corvette, which I think is a joke. A mistake. Yeah, a mistake. I mean, forget So we're going to see it in two weeks at the Detroit Auto Show, less than two weeks. Sunday night on the 13th, but they dribbled out info and stuff. They should have just just put a moratorium on it. Just, you know, why don't you just surprise us for once? I agree totally. It's just, just, so I hope... It is going to be one of the big news stories at the Auto Show. But to your point, why tip your hat so... When's it go on sale? Like a year from now? Uh, next fall, next August. Okay. okay. At yeah. the earliest, probably next yeah. fall. That's yeah, crazy. Next fall, meaning 2014. Or you mean 2013? No, 2013. 2013? Yeah, fall okay. of 13. So it's not too bad, but still way in advance. I mean, it's just, I hope Ford pays attention and doesn't do the same thing for the Mustang. They should just wait. I would show the next Mustang on the exact date that they introduced the first one. Which I want to say was April 15th. And the reason I know that, because it's the best day in the world. They shouldn't show it next year at the Detroit Auto Show, which I'm sure they're going to do. They shouldn't. They shouldn't show it unless it coincides with the New York Auto Show. They should show it on the 15th. I agree. It should be just a blast. And I say it's the best day in the world because it's my birthday. Oh, the 15th of April. Hmm. And just so, because you probably didn't know, it's the day that Abraham Lincoln died, and it's also the day that the Titanic sunk. So, big date. Full house. <laughs> so, Ed, you got any uh, New Year's resolutions for the industry? Well, you know, I think that the industry needs to get serious about market share and market share forecasts and projections. You know, we are going to hear... Uh, next week during press days at the Detroit Auto Show, we're going to hear a lot of projections for people claiming that they're going to conquer the world. And and at the end of the day, uh, some of them will and some of them won't. You know, um, but the reality issue, I think things are looking good, and we'll talk about that later for the industry. Um, And those who have the hot products are the ones who will probably do the best. Yeah, my my, uh, resolution for the industry is maintain discipline no more building cars and trucks to try and generate good financial numbers uh no more you know idling plants when you miss that target no more sales blowouts when you miss that target just build to demand and stick to it i to me that's what i want to see the industry do. so thanksgiving gm had 130 day supply of pickup trucks, and now all of a sudden they have 80. 
Well, they had a blowout month in December. Yeah, we'll, we'll probably talk more about that when uh, Anthony Pratt comes on later in the show. But Well, yeah, I mean, you go if you drive by a dealer, they'd come right, out and Peter, give you a they truck. They had a blowout month that is not sustainable. And this gets back to what I was just talking about. They, they, they threw on the incentives and they blew them out the door. They almost caught uh, up to where the F-Series had been, but I think Ford got wind of what GM was doing. It did the same thing. They had a blowout month with the F-Series. But uh, so, you know, it's been that way forever, though. It's hard to change your ways. I mean, that's the way it works. Sales guys want to sell cars. The marketing guys want to market them. And, you know, when you have too many of them sitting around on dealership lots, you have to put cash on those. You have to do something to. So especially get, the trucks. Yeah. I mean, at one point there was, what, something like. Eleven or twelve thousand dollars on some of these trucks. I mean, it, yeah, it got completely out of hand. But but there's going to be a payback in uh, this month. You know, they, they they both had blowout sales in December, and I'll bet when you average December and January put together, it's going to be about where they would have been anyway. Except that they had to throw all these incentives on the the hood to make it happen. Yeah. The one thing about pickup trucks, though, is that the margins are so good on pickup trucks that you can throw a lot of cash on the to move them <laughs> if you have to. You can. You yeah. can. Well, yeah. I mean, if you're sitting there in Texas and looking at those ads in December, it's just like, well, honey, it's almost free. <laughs> <laughs> we could get ourselves down there and get us a new truck. <laughs> Look what followed me home. <laughs> All right. Another thing, I uh, uh, got word this week, very sad, Imre Molnar uh, passed away. We had him on the show a couple of years ago. He was uh, from the Center for Creative Studies, for people who may not know that. It's uh, one of the preeminent, uh, really, art and design schools in the world, and it's got its own transportation design It's really school. come into its own in the last 10 years. It really has. But, but even before that, I mean, people like Ralph Gilles uh, is a CCS graduate. Um, I, I'm blanking out on some of the others, but there's a lot of famous designers in the automotive industry that graduated from CCS. And, and even though Imre wasn't, wasn't thought of as a car guy, a car designer per se, his expertise and his work had been in a lot of different areas as head of that department and, and then ultimately as provost of the school, he was involved in that de development that you talked about the last 10 years. And you go to an auto show anywhere in the world and you'd see Imre walking around looking for his graduates who were the design guys up on the stands and, and looking at the vehicles that he liked the best. And very well known in the, the global design community. Yes, like, like you said, even though he wasn't a true car guy. Uh, he liked cars. Yes, he did. So that, that was just very surprising. And I had visited with him and his students in mid-December. And uh, December 14th, because I went and looked it up today, I, I, I visited with him on December 14th, and they were showing me some of the stuff they were developing. And then December 30th, I got a word that he had died of a heart attack while out bicycling on vacation in California. So... It hit harder for me, even having just been with him so yeah. recently. So, you know, it was terrible. But speaking of design, what do you guys make of, here's Peter Schreier, gets hired away from Audi by Kia, transforms the way that Kia looks. Bang, their sales take off. And now they've named him, what, a, a president in the Hyundai Kia group. I think they're getting smarter. I think... Uh... Uh, well, their big knock on them is they're so insular. And so maybe this is a, a, a message that we appreciate what he has done and we are not going to go backwards. We're not going to take advantage of that. We're going to instead, you know, promote it and enhance it. And if they continue along that path, well, is this the first year they've, the Hyundai Kia has sold 700,000? Vehicles in the U.S. In the U.S. alone, and uh, I want to say 7.4 million worldwide. Yow, yeah. that's really an impressive number. And Schreier's made a huge impact. Big impact, and but I'm taking this as more than just a reward. I mean, I and I got to learn more about this. I don't know what they mean by president. Well, they have like three presidents. Three presidents of the group, and I don't know what the other two do. So I want to learn about that, but. To me, this is giving him a lot more power 
and responsibility for the, the the way the vehicles will be in the coming years. Absolutely not just the way they look, but their content and and I would say more than just Kia. I mean, if he's a president in the Hyundai Kia group, I kind of read this as meaning he's going to oversee design for both the brands. That would make sense. I mean, he's he has the skill and he has the. And I'm you know I'm test driving a, a Hyundai Equus right now, which is a. A pretty damn good car, except the styling stinks. It's a, it's a mishmash of Mercedes and Lexus and uh, I expe- Buick. I expect the next one will not be that. I agree. But I, I think from what you've said and others have said that all the ingredients are there. I mean, still, d- dynamically, they have a way to go. But... They do. No, I would agree. That's one of the downfalls of the Equus. But if they do a breathtaking design in the next generation one? Right. Watch and, and tighten up that chassis a little bit more, which I would expect them to do. It's, I, I'll tell you, for a luxury car, first-time effort, it's kind of like Lexus. Maybe not quite as good as Lexus was, but awfully close to it. So you know, like you're saying, Peter, that the next generation is just going to be... Should be a watching. design statement for... The, the Koreans are still on a learning curve when it comes to how to be an automobile company and how to do the sort of things you do and, and, and how you source parts and components and, and the people. You know, it used to be that, you know, uh, they would hire a, a rising star to be the U.S. sales head and then uh, at some point throw them out, throw them out so the, the Korean could take credit for all of the... Uh, uh, the progress and things happen. That's not that way anymore. You know, they're m- much more sensible about it. Well, I find this interesting too because I think maybe design is not just getting more emphasis, but designers possibly are going to get more power, which I would love to see because I still think uh, the finance people have and the purchasing people <laughs> have way too much power in a car company. In the big car companies. Well, as, as I've said, you know, with the democratization of technology going forward, what is the pr- ultimate product differentiator? It's design. So I think designers, and uh, if they're savvy, are going to become much more powerful. And even on the operational side of the business, for example, at Chrysler, Ralph Shields, he's taken over uh, more responsibility than just a, a design guy. Than, for example, um, they've had in the past. Well, I hope uh, that Schreyer really does have a whole lot more power in Hyundai Kia, and I hope that he starts to produce results, and I hope the rest of the industry then is forced to follow suit, because I'd love to see designers get a lot more power. And Peter, you've talked about this for, for ever since we started the show, yeah. you know, the, the kind of power that somebody like Bill Mitchell at the heyday at General Motors had, or Harley Earl before him, who reported directly to the chairman, not up through the engineering organization or the product development organization. Well, guess what? When Mitchell retired and GM, their reaction was to clamp down on design because Mitchell was just like a wild man and spending money and everything. It is taking them 35, almost 40 years to get back to where GM design was. Because and they did some horrible things to their designers over yeah. the years. They really did. It wasn't, it wasn't, I mean, it was bad. Well, it was bad. And, you know, we had Lutz on the show earlier talking about how, you know, they had to check all the boxes, the VLEs, the vehicle line executives. You know, they had to hit their, their timing costs and their their costs, uh, timing, and, you know, all these different things that they had to check down. And, and so the stuff looked so bland because purchasing had too much say in how these cars could look. Engineering had too much say in how these cars would look. Manufacturing definitely had too much say. And I'm not saying that those entities should not or cannot, but you don't get the scintillating design that make people go, oh, my God, that's what I've got to have unless you have designers really running the roost as to how these cars are going to look. Yeah. Think Aztec. <laughs> Perfect example. Actually, Perfect example of a car that checked all the boxes. Actually, the Aztec, I will repeat this forever, the Aztec concept was pretty cool. Wasn't bad at all. I agree totally. It, if it, it had looked like that, we wouldn't be making fun of the car Actually, today. the packaging of that concept was, was very good. Was a forerunner for the industry. Sure. No, look, I, the, the people who bought Aztecs loved them. They were very loyal to the vehicle. But that was a small group because the car yeah. was, again, such a mishmash 
yeah. of all these different voices saying, oh, it's got to be like this, it's got to be like that. Well, you know, that the concept was well received at Detroit, and then they tried to bring it to production, and they, they made some you know, major errors. What was the biggest error is the only platform they could put it on was the minivan platform. And right away, the, uh, the actual concept had a little more voluptuousness to it. Mm -hmm. the, the, uh, when it was put on the minivan platform, it became slab-sided, and that was the end of it. That's the, that happens a lot. You go from yeah. a stunning design and a great concept to something that... Well, look at the SSR. Yes. That was a great concept. But in the execution of the production model, it was this overweight, under, underpowered. underpowered, on the wrong chassis, everything about it. A lot of quality problems yeah. at the outset. Yeah, and at the end, of course, it wasn't bad. <laughs> and that's but, the typical GM way. They yeah. get it just perfect and then kill it because it's not selling. <laughs> that's what they did with the Fiero. Right. The last Fiero was, a pretty was good not car. bad, and the one on the drawing board was a radical statement that GM quashed because it was more radical and more uh, desirable than the Corvette. Heck, the last Corvair was not a bad vehicle. <laughs> I had one. I love my 69 Corvair Monza Coupe, by the way. Loved it. Still a good-looking car It today. still is. Put my J.C. Whitney headers on it. <laughs> and it's had the initial emissions controls on it, so when you'd start it up, a blue flame would come out both pipes until it warmed up. It's <laughs> awesome. Okay. Well, I, I, I told the, the Aztec story before where, you know, went to the VLE and said, you know, no disrespect, but how did you come out with a car like this? And he said, well, you don't understand. This is what styling gave us. So I went to styling and said, why did you guys style a car like this? And they said, well, you don't understand. Manufacturing forced us to put it on the minivan. This dictated the, the proportions of the vehicle. So I go to manufacturing and say, why did you force them to put this thing on a minivan? They go, you don't understand. Finance said that's what we had to use. Ron Zarella liked it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you but know, what it said is nobody was in charge of the program. No one said, yeah. no, you're not going to violate this look because this is what's going to set the customer's heart racing. Well, GM design started to emerge from the darkness in the mid-'90s. And, you know, you started to see a breath of fresh air and the concepts and you saw the Cadillac Evoque at the, what was it, the 99 or the 2000 Detroit Auto Show? One or the other, right. Yeah. Uh, but then um, John Smale took over GM and then the, the Zarella, Zarella reign of terror happened. Yeah. And then uh, design got set back again and that's when they brought out that 2000 Impala, which was the classic committee designed right. car. Right. And, um, but now, fortunately, things are back. Ed Welburn's done a great job. Yeah, he has. But, you know, he, he's doing a good job because Bob Lutz got in there, totally revamped how product developed. Well, the first thing Bob did is he's, he stayed at an office for the first three weeks at Design, you know, just to get Design, get their mojo back. Just say, you know, let's cut it loose, guys. Yeah, he empowered them. Yeah. And uh, that, you know, that... That really energized that company. I mean, it all comes down to the true believers. I mean, we're going to talk about Chrysler's, you know, fabulous sales. It's not Marchione and the Italians who did that. It's the true believers at Chrysler who were there and who've been doing the work all along that are responsible for the results right now. It's true. They're, they're doing some great design and engineering at Chrysler. It's, uh, it's been pretty spectacular. Hey, I don't know if you guys uh, have seen what we've been doing on daily, but over the break, I was out cross-country skiing. I'm in the middle of the woods uh, in one of the state parks, and I come across this old rusted-out car in the middle of that. Ben, I don't know if you can bring that up on the screen or not. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Look at this That's thing. That's where I left it? <laughs> <laughs> so we've been having fun with this. Uh, we got some more pictures. Uh, so what I'm trying to figure out is, what is this car? And we're, we're kind of having a contest on this, even though I don't really know the answer. But uh, coming up very quickly, you'll see I brushed some snow off the engine, and you can see it says Spitfire cast into the head. So it's an inline six. And when I uh, did some internet searching. This has got to be an early 1950s DeSoto or Chrysler. I'm not sure which, and uh, we've been getting all kinds of suggestions from uh, viewers. 
as to, to what this thing is. So we're going to do a little piece on it uh, on tomorrow's AutoLine Daily. But uh, I just get a hoot out of looking at this thing. You, you can see a, a tree growing up through the engine compartment there. But uh, I, I brought it up just in case you guys might have a brilliant flash of knowing exactly what it might be. Nope, I do no. not. <laughs> <laughs> it's an early design study for a... <laughs> well, what I love is there's no road right nearby. I mean, somebody literally just pushed this thing down a hill and it's been sitting there for decades just rusting away and I stumble across this thing and I happen to have my phone so I took some pictures with it and uh, I think it's pretty cool. I, I think it's pretty wild. So anybody else has got any cool pictures out there, uh, let us know. Send them in. And with that, it's probably a, a good segue to uh, take a commercial break and bring on our guests. So, Ben, let's give a shout out to our friends at Bridgestone. Anthony Pratt, welcome to AutoLine After Hours. Thanks, John. Appreciate so you're, you're the head of forecasting for RL Polk, right? I'm the head of forecasting for their Americas group. Uh, so we have a forecasting practice that's global, and I have the privilege of running the, uh, the Americas forecasting practice. And R.L. Polk, just for people who don't know, give us the thumbnail of it. Sure. R.L. Polk is, uh, you know, if you like to support Michigan-based products, you know, you can support the Michigan-based products by, uh, you know, by buying Polk products or Polk data. Uh, Polk has been business. Now, remember, we got a global audience here. They don't care about buying Michigan oh, stuff. Oh, that's true. That's so, true. So sell the company otherwise. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, we're global. Uh, we're global in breach. We have uh, locations throughout the world. And um, we actually are over 140 years old. Uh, we've 140, 140. We started off in the directory business. So uh, Ralph Lang Polk was the uh, originator. He essentially started a directory service uh, for the Detroit area and the lower Michigan area. And uh, as the story goes, and if Stephen's watching, I might get this wrong. So I'm a little bit uh, nervous about and that. And you're talking about Stephen, Stephen Polk, Polk, the guy who's He's the chair, running so the company. Still a now. private owned company. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Polk family is still heavily involved. He comes to work every day. Uh, and it's Fisker, so he, so Peter, he's the one who uh, who uh, who bought the Fisker. So uh, uh, so now, actually, we're exclusively dedicated to uh, to automotive. Uh, as the story goes, uh, Sloan contacted um, Stephen's great great grandfather and uh, was curious to find out who is buying his vehicles, and more specifically. And, and when we when you say Sloan, you mean Alfred Sloan, Alfred the greatest Sloan. chairman that General Motors ever had. Exactly. So exactly. So. He was interested in understanding where his products were, and uh, you know, so that really created an opportunity. Meaning, and, uh, who's buying them in what regions so, of the yeah, country? Yeah, and so what we do, how we find that out, actually, we uh, started uh, Polk started buying the registration data from the Department of Motor Vehicles from each of the states, and then that expanded globally. So what we've done is assembled the uh, the registration data uh, with VIN level detail, uh, and as you can imagine, we can do quite a bit of analysis with that. So. Uh, it's used by marketers, it's used by manufacturers, it's used by the supplier community, and I have the pleasure of using it to generate a forecast. Now, here's a question for you. We just got December sales today, and you guys will probably report uh, sometime this month what registrations for December Registra were. There is a bit of a lag. In some How case, much of a lag? Well, it depends on the state. Uh, Michigan, for example, we get it on a daily basis. California, I think, is one of the states that actually is about a 40-day delay. Okay. But anyway, at some point you're going to announce what's, what actual Reg registrations mm -hmm. for December were, and it's not going to match up with the sales of the car companies no, report. It, it probably won't. We see roughly, on average, about 100,000 unit variants. So I'll let you guess which way that variance goes between registration and sales. Well, that means <clears> the <throat> car companies are reporting 100,000 more cars than are actually getting registered. Yep. That's right. Where do they go? That's a good question, you know, and I don't want to rat anyone out, but you we actually, some of our oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> this is after hours, man. That's right. Uh, the, the manufacturers actually use our data to kind of keep track and keep the, uh, the dealers honest as well. So it's kind of interesting uh, uh, how our data is used and the number of ways that it can be used. Well, you know, in uh, retail, they talk about shrinkage, you know, stuff that gets you know, falls off the truck, falls off the truck, right. right, gets damaged or whatever. But there's no way that's 100,000 cars a year worth. No, it's <laughs> not shrinkage. I would say that's probably not shrinkage. It's probably some games that are taking place at some dealers, you know, and, and that's supposedly a byproduct or the negative side of 
some of these stair-stepped incentive uh, options that the, uh, the manufacturers are using with dealers. Wow. That's a lot. I didn't realize it's that much. It's roughly um, 100,000 unit variants. So a, a year. Per year. Well, okay. Yeah. I, I wanted to make sure it no, wasn't no, no. per month. <laughs> now, do, do, you, do you try and match the registrations to the MCOs to find out if they're real vehicles? I mean, you they have to have... Well, we have VIN level details. So uh, what's funny is sometimes the, those, the same VIN will be reported numerous times. And so that's one of the, the real, I guess, the differentiators for Polk is that, you know, because we've been doing this for so long, we've gotten pretty good at kind of filtering out those uh, VINs that show up. In some cases, someone may register a VIN or to, maybe they'll sell it. Some of these will see it's sale, and then maybe the approval doesn't go through. So maybe the, the DMS data will indicate there's a sale, but then maybe people at the end of the day don't qualify for the actual transaction, and it doesn't make it to, uh, trans, um, to registration. In some cases, people will register and then return the vehicle in a relatively short period. Uh, so that messes up um, the data sometimes as well. Could some of it just be theft? Could be. Could be, could very well be. Could, are, are some of these vehicles? For, could be sales outside of um, countries. Gray I, market yeah, sales? Gray, gray market, market yeah. stuff could mm. go overseas. Or uh, could it be possibly that some of the vehicles aren't registered because they're not titled to a. Sure. Yeah, let's say, you know, I, maybe a collector who's buying a vehicle and not registering that vehicle. That's, that's certainly possible as well. Unbelievable. Yeah, Very interesting. Not 100,000. Not 100,000. No, no, no. no. It, it's more, I'm sure you're right, gamesmanship. There's a bit of gamesmanship. And, and right. so dealers can report cars at being sold at different times or registered to get what? Holdbacks from the factory? Well, I'm not as familiar with the sales side, so I can't really speak to that. So okay. I don't, I don't want to. Don't speak, speak to that, then. And let's not speak that. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you make of uh, uh, 2012, U.S. market? 2012 actually ended up being a great year. Um, we actually went into the year, this time last year, uh, predicting that the sales uh, registrations would be 13.7 million units. And, uh, you know, we found out today from the source, right, 14.49 was what the sales came in, up 13%. So... Uh, in spite of a lot of uh, potential setbacks, um, the CAW avoided a, a strike. Um, the uh, Sandy Hurricane actually created uh, demand at the end of the day. What uh, was the, the number? Because some dealers came out and said, oh, yeah, there was over 200,000 cars that were damaged. And then like a, a well, week later, someone else came out and said, no, it was more like 20,000. No, it, was, it wasn't 200, over 200,000. There were, by our estimates, because we, we actually looked at the dealers and we looked at... Uh, uh, the exposure. And uh, for that month, there was probably 250,000 units of exposure. What does that um, mean? So, well, October in particular, as you recall, that was came right at the end of the month. On the ground, you mean inventory yeah. in the path of the On storm? On the ground, inventory. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, well, I shouldn't say inventory. It's more or less registrations at those dealers, their average registrations. So we weren't tracking inventory. We we're looking at average registrations and what that sales would amount to. It came at the final week of October. So um, even if you were in the D.C. area, you didn't know which way that storm was going to go. Uh, so it's a pretty good chance you were probably buying water and uh, food and perhaps plywood if it, all things went really bad, or maybe a generator, but instead of a vehicle. So you may have delayed that purchase for at least a week, which put sales in November. It's one of the reasons November was strong. But as uh, we saw today, December ended up strong, too, at a 15.3. Yeah. I think is what it came yep. in. So, yeah, strong finish to a good year. Um, we're up, um, as I said, 13 percent. Next year, we think uh, this growth will continue. Uh, we're actually forecasting 15.3 million units. Uh, so the, the so pace, up a million. Up a, well, what do we say? 14, 14, 14 49. Yeah. yeah. So 14, 5, so 800. Yeah. It, that equates to roughly 7% increase. So we're seeing the pace of increase slowing, mm -hmm. um, which is an indication to us that, you know, a lot of the forecasters and analysts will say, we're seeing growth because of pent-up demand. And that's, that's for sure. Uh, the average age of a vehicle in operation now is over 11 years, about 11.3 years. The average More length, to that point, I heard that 20% of them are over 16 years old. That's, I, I, could, I could give that data to you and yeah. verify it if you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> I may want to take you up on that. Right, sure. What you were saying. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I think is interesting is that the average length of ownership for a new vehicle, uh, so when someone is, so we can actually track when someone purchases a vehicle, registers it, owns it, and then 
that somebody else per registers that vehicle. So we assume there's been a transaction that takes place. And we've seen that increase from roughly 50 months in as recently as 2002 up to 71 months uh, in 2012. And the reason for that, number one, the cars do last longer. They are better built. And number two, it's the way they're financed. You know, the finance companies are financing them out to 60 or 72 months or longer in some cases. Sure. And the owner's underwater. They don't have any equity in the vehicle until they get well down the road. You know, what's scary is we actually saw a trend where auto refinancing increased by roughly 20% last year as well. So if they did have equity in their car, they took it out to go buy that flat screen TV or perhaps or something for Christmas. <laughs> People used to do that with their homes <laughs> until the home market dissipated. Okay, so we still have pent up demand. We're relieved. But we, we look a little that. bit deeper into the decade because I don't know if it was you who was saying that you're looking for a recession uh, around 2017. Well, it's not necessarily re recession, but we, you know, auto sales are cyclical just as uh, the economy is, of course. And uh, some of the biggest drivers that Im impact auto sales would be unemployment, the gross domestic product growth, inflation rates, the things that are impacting sales today. You know, we're in a pretty good position, you know, inflation's pretty, or the interest rates are pretty low. Um, so that's one of the reasons that in the combination of the pent-up demand, relieve, relieving pent-up demand in 12 has led the, the auto sector to be one of the sectors that are leading the economy out of the, uh, the, um, the recession. Yeah, we actually show 15.3 for 2013, and we actually are predicting that we'll realize uh, as high as 16.2 million units in 2015, and I think that's what you're talking about. By 16, we're showing a bit of a leveling off, and we're forecasting uh, 16 million. Now, let's, yeah, go ahead. Ed. No, no, go ahead. I, I, I'll wait. And it's only 200,000 units, but you know, I think the 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 I think the takeaway on that is we don't think the industry will get to back to that 17 million unit range again, at least through the scope of our forecast. But it, should it really? Because the 17 million was with giveaway credit that anybody could qualify for. So I would say that 17 number was a false number. It wasn't really indicative of what the market should have been at. Oh, absolutely. You had a number of things. It was just as, you know, you'd mentioned, the, you know, the credit uh, industry and banking and, and real estate. Most of the vehicles that are purchased are either uh, financed or leased. And so there's a bank involved. And so what was going on with the, re the, uh, the, uh, the re real estate market was going on with the, uh, the auto industry as well. So we easy access to credit. Arguably, people who are qualifying for loans who had no business getting loans, you had overcapacity, roughly 5 million units of overcapacity for the domestics. Um, you had a ridiculous union contract with the jobs bank where they're paying over 90% of their employees to stay home, of their wages, I should say, if they stayed home. Uh, so they really began to move metal and heavily incentivize products uh, that got us to that level. And it wasn't healthy for the industry. And we saw what it did to uh, General Motors and Chrysler. Now, sure. Anthony, they used to talk about a trend line for sales. And, you know, if we'd have been sitting here five years ago uh, to, to start um, 2008, we'd have been looking at a year, business off a little bit, but people were expecting things to bounce back the next year in nine. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that was, that was three months before the gasoline prices spiked, nine months before Lehman, and, and you know, all of the things that hit after that didn't sure. factor into it. I can remember sales executives, Jim Press for one, talking about 18 million just on the horizon and not too far down the road, it's going to be 20 million units a year. Now, I, that was obviously wildly optimistic, but have we shifted the trend line for car sales? We did. And, you know, in our model, if you if you think about statistical modeling, uh, you have a long-term trend line. And what you do, you look for the variances between the ups and the lows and then try to identify those or predict those. I mean, you're good if you can predict them. Um, but we've actually had to give that era a haircut in our trend line just so we are not influencing the future trend line. And, uh, you know, so we tried to quantify what we thought was the you know, the amount that was heavily incentivized. We call that the era of spent-up demand, and now we're actually realizing the era of pent-up demand. So. <laughs> I have never heard that, spent-up uh, demand. Exuberance. <laughs> but, you know, I would say 15.5, we're back. I mean, if we hit 15.5 this year, that, to me, that's a normal market. Yeah. That, 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 that means full recovery in, in auto sales. Well, we, we, we still have some recovery opportunities there, I think, uh, because of the length of ownership. But to your point, Ed, you know, it, this could be a permanent shift where people are holding on to their vehicles longer. And I think you and I talked about this a couple months ago. 
John, we're, uh, we're talking about the cadence of product replacement. So in a lifetime, let's say if you started buying a product in your early 20s and you continue to purchase it through your early 80s, um, and you say, okay, historically there was a four-year replacement rate on that. That equates to roughly 13 products throughout your life. Maybe you have more if you have multiple um, drivers in the home. Just by reducing, you know, if you permanently extend that ownership by two years, you're reducing the cadence of purchases from 13 in your life down, down to as few as nine. So that's, I think that's significant. That's, that's a huge like revenue that. drop off for the car companies sure. per customer. Mm -hmm. uh, how does the price of gasoline or barrel of petroleum, if you like, how does that affect demand up or down? It, people need to replace their cars more quickly if the price of gasoline is going up. I mean, that's sort of the conventional wisdom. Conventional wisdom. What we found actually is it's not necessarily the level of the gasoline price, but it's the rate of gasoline price increases. You'd mentioned 2008. We saw roughly 100 percent increase in gasoline prices, and we saw a spike in demand for small vehicles, and we saw uh, inventory numbers build on full-size trucks. Six months later, or maybe eight months later, uh, it flopped back, and people went back. They kind of—it's kind of like water. You know, you step into cool water, and you free, it really feels cold. But if you're in it and it warms up slowly, uh, it's less uh, less noticeable. And I think that's true with the uh, the price now. People will often ask me, is there a threshold? And when will we hit that threshold when everyone will want to begin buying hybrids or electric vehicles? And I think that's, again, that's, it's relative. It's, it's the price increase is relative. Gas prices in the United States are lower than any other, uh, well, I should say most countries uh, in the world. Even more importantly, a barrel of oil in the United States is significantly below the market and price could, globally. Uh, and it could come down. I mean, if these trends are fulfilled where we actually become um, more uh, self-reliant on our own source of, of fuel, then, man, all bets are off. I mean, frack, could, baby, frack. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> but what, I guess the, the, the wild card is corporate average fuel economy standards. And, um, you know, so what we know now is that maybe consumers aren't demanding more fuel efficient vehicles. They are. I shouldn't say they aren't. They are. That's, that's a fact. When I was um, at another uh, research company a few years ago, we did uh, survey research, and we found that people were more interested in the number of cup holders than they were in fuel efficiency. Now, that's changed. People are actually watching uh, the fuel efficiency impact. Uh, but it's, um, it still it is, you know, making that shift to those alternative powertrain technologies, I think we have quite a ways to go. And so, you know, corporate average fuel economy standards is helping to drive that. And that's why we're seeing smaller vehicles. We're seeing more fuel efficient uh, um, alternatives. We're seeing more power being squeezed out of smaller engines. Uh, and that will continue well into 25. So Ed mentioned uh, Jim Press a few years ago saying, hey, maybe it's going to get to 20 million. I, I still think that might be possible in the sense that the population of the U.S. goes up by two and a half to three million people a year. So from the year to 2010 to 2020, we'll see almost a 30 million person increase in the population. Mm -hmm. That's got to drive car sales, except, and this is where I'm asking you, uh, disposable household income has absolutely flatlined, right. if not declined. And I think that's the major reason why people are holding on to their cars longer. College graduates not being able to find jobs and go out and make that first purchase of the new car. Remember the first one, new one you bought? Sure you know, do, it's yeah. exciting stuff. Very exciting. You know, I, there, are, there are economic factors that, that can... And no question, and, and you know, we, we think you know, the way the, the economy is now is the way it will perhaps always be. I saw a survey came out earlier this week where half of the uh, population you know, thinks we're, we're, we're worse off now and we'll likely continue to be worse off and then, than we will going forward, and the other half thought we're gonna, you know, things are improving. Now, they happen to be affiliated with certain political parties, you know, so you can imagine which was saying what's going to be better and which was going to be worse. But I think the main takeaway is that um, the... Where we are now has delayed, uh, you had mentioned, you know, the, the millennials, the Gen Y, the baby boomers, kids, they've delayed adulthood, uh, you know, and some are saying that they are not interested in vehicles. That's partially true, but I, I, I agree with you. I think they're going to come back, you know, you shouldn't write them off, and they're going to come back when they get into the family formation uh, stage in their life, and they're also going to come back when the, the economy improves. We saw their net worth drop considerably, and they're not homeowners, so they're not losing value in their home. 
um, but it's uh, it's taking on more and more uh, debt, probably in the form of college loans. The the whole zip car phenomenon, the mm -hmm. automobile sharing thing, where people don't own their own cars, they use one when they need it. Um, will that affect the trend line? Will that affect the sales as well? Well, I think it was Enterprise acquiring them yesterday, right? Was gave them uh, um, Avis. Avis, sorry, Avis did. Yeah, Avis. Avis, isn't it? Or Avis yeah, Hertz? Avis. Or? Yeah, Avis Hertz. So they, I guess that gives them some credibility in that business model for almost half a billion dollars, too. Yeah. Unless they just bought them to put them out of business. <laughs> Which may not be far off, Ed, because uh, I know Hertz, for a fact, had, and I believe Avis, both, both brands had their own, what they call, on-demand right. car sharing. So maybe they did just buy out a competitor. The, the industry, the rental industry, has been moving in that direction. And I, I just don't know what... Thing. Zipcar has, I think they claim over 700,000 uh, members, because it's almost like joining a club, you know, you don't just use it on a whim, you got to sign up for the service and do a, 700,000 people is a lot of people. Yeah, uh, how many of those people would, would buy a vehicle if they, if they didn't have access to the zip card? I don't know. Is that a, a measurable? Well, I, I, you know, where you're seeing the zip, zip car uh, business models succeed is in the densely populated cities where uh, people don't need or don't use a car regularly and that the, uh, it's not so much the cost of purchasing the vehicle where maybe the price of parking the vehicle somewhere becomes uh, uh, unreasonable. And so that, that's a great um, opportunity for success in that model. But there's still a large population that it's just not practical or people just don't want it. I mean, I can tell you that I'm not that opposed to it, but I can guarantee you my wife is not interested in it at all. And I'm, I'm not sure. interested in it, because <laughs> as I keep saying, I'm going to come in and, you know, somebody's kid threw up in the back seat and someone else spilled their maybe McDonald's the fries at the front. The the How long can you do that? What kind of a sick puppy doesn't want to own their own automobile? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody <laughs> listening to this show. <laughs> yeah, that's probably true. So, yeah, we, I mean, we see 2013 is going to be a, continue to be a good year. And, uh, you know, we, we are pretty optimistic, um, although we're not, you know, anticipating the, uh, that uh, 17 million range again for quite some time. Hmm. And as, as we all know, there are shocks that can come. Uh, a, a very hot war in the Middle East, for example, some disruption in the flow of petroleum would affect things. A, a, a major uh, worsening of things in Europe or elsewhere. I mean, they're all things... Could be, and that's the negative side, and I agree yeah. with you. On the, on the positive side, as you said earlier, frack, baby, frack. I mean, I, I think the United States is in the lead, and I believe the rest of the world's going to come along. I think we're entering a new era of cheap energy. Just as, you know, mankind once changed from wood to coal, mm -hmm. then from coal to oil, I think we're on the verge of switching over to gas, whether it's natural gas or methane or propane or whatever it happens to be. You know, the, the price of natural gas has plummeted in this country because of, you know, fracking. And the U.S. is the first country to get in on this. There's others that are going to get in on it, too. Sure. Russia, China, Argentina, others are all looking at doing it, too. So I, I agree with you, Ed. There, there, there's plenty of downside risk. I think there's a lot of upside potential as well. No, I, I would agree. I would agree. You know, and, and you had mentioned, you know, some of the risks, you know, that's, you know, I'm looking at our concerns for 2013, and that's certainly one of the, the, the concerns on our shortlist is the tension in the uh, Middle East. You know, we haven't seen a lot of that in the headlines just because of the ridiculous politics that's taking place in Washington and, and how we are all concerned how it might impact um, our, um, our income in 2013. That's certainly a risk in 13. you know, just the, 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 the political tension in the environment there and how that impacts uh, the uh, our disposable income. But uh, Iran is, is a serious threat. And uh, I think that, uh, you know, it'll be interesting to watch in the coming months if either um, Israel or the United States or both together uh, react. You know, so the president's been pretty vocal about, you know, taking steps that are necessary. And that will most certainly impact the price of gasoline and could cause a spike in the big gas that we were talking about. Wow. Lots to, to sure. be on the lookout for. On that note, yeah. let's predict the future of <laughs> 2013. <laughs> hey, uh, let's get to the rapid fire segment and uh, <sighs> see if we've got any questions coming in uh, from the audience here. And uh, Ben, let's get to rapid fire. Let it rip. A 
Okay, Anthony, you, you, you. then there's the explosion that I always yeah, forget is I coming. Waiting, I was waiting for that. Yeah. So you know the drill of, of sure, all this, sure. but uh, Peter, it starts with you. Turn Left wants to know, what do you see going on with racing this year? Anything we should specifically look for? Uh, well, my calm next week is about that, my racing calm. But, you know, um, NASCAR has new uh, production appearing bodywork for the manufacturers, uh, finally jettisoning the car of tomorrow. But that doesn't, that, that side of NASCAR is good, but the other side of NASCAR is they haven't fixed the fundamental problems, decle decreasing attendance, declining viewing numbers, it's a real problem. And you've hit on one of the keys, too. Too many races, yeah, and they're too, too long. Too many races, too long, too much repetitive visits to the same tracks. Uh, NASCAR's in trouble. Uh, IndyCar, not much better. I mean, IndyCar has the Indianapolis 500, and then a schedule that nobody really cares about beyond that. Uh, they lack a major sponsor that's going to really promote them. Um, IZOD's been doing it, but they need... They need real horsepower. They lack diversity and creativity in their cars, you know, so they're just kind of going along. And then sports car racing, this is the last year that the ALMS and Grand Am conduct separate schedules. And um, this weekend is a pre-test at Daytona. They're going to announce the initial rules package for 2014. So, I mean, racing's in flux. And, um, you know, 2013, it could be pivotal, really. Hmm. I think uh, one thing to look at uh, in NASCAR, too, is Penske switching over to Ford. I think yeah. that's going to be an interesting yeah, Brad Keselowski is the future of the sport. The young young gun is, who's won. Penske switched to Ford. That's going to be interesting. But the tedium of the NASCAR schedule is something they refuse to deal with. And um, it's going to kill them. It is. And I, I totally agree with you know what you said about Indy. They should have gone with the Delta Wing, which is going to be racing four points this year, right? In, in the ALMS. ALMS. Yeah, Indy could still embrace the Delta Wing. They could still embrace different technology. But uh, as I say in my column that's going to run next week, is that ultimately the Hellmans might have to divest themselves of the Speedway. Because really? For real change to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they're they're just operating and they're they're controlling the downward spiral, and that's not what that mm -hmm. that whole thing needs. You know, I did uh, uh, an interview with Ben Bowlby that we're going to run on uh, on Autoline Daily, and uh, talking all about the Delta Wing. He says there's a lot more speed in that car yet. Oh yeah. You know, it's only run two races. And, and let's uh, not forget, Ben first designed that car four years ago. Mm -hmm. He's already moved on to something else, I'm sure. <laughs> Ooh, I, I, I like what you're saying there. I'm going to have to pay a little bit more attention to that. Okay, uh, Anthony, Ariba8 says, uh, you mentioned your title has Americas in it. Does that mean you forecast for Latin and South America as well? If so, what do you see happening in those areas? Oh, man, my uh, South American... Uh forecast uh, lead is going to kill me because I, I, I <laughs> didn't come prepared to talk about it. Uh, we do. We, uh, we forecast uh, South America as well as uh, all of North America and Central America. We, we forecast for every country. So uh, South America has been an interesting one to watch, actually. It started off in 2012 slower than expected, uh, picked up pace in the, uh, the latter part of the year, uh, so it's actually going to come in a little under our for forecast. And 2013 will continue to, to be a, a struggle. Um, but uh, we do longer term, we see uh, South America and Brazil in particular uh, growing. You know, so it's going to be, it'll be helped by World Cup coming up uh, as then on the tails of that with the Olympics. But uh, that'll have a marginal lift for the, uh, for the industry. Uh, but I think, you know, for the economy and, and it'll benefit from that. We're seeing an increase in Brazil, uh, more antitrust activity, which is actually hurting the sales. Uh, they're trying to protect the manufacturing base there. The Chinese are really coming in in force. Uh, so we are seeing some competitive threats there that are kind of throwing the balance off in Brazil. So, Anthony, did you see a year ago, did you see Chrysler knocking General Motors out of second place in Canada? <laughs> no, that one caught me by surprise, actually, when you, uh, you had uh, mentioned it today. So that's... Uh, you heard it here first, right? 
Okay, I'm going to throw this out to all of you, but I'm going to start with you, Ed. Scott in Cleveland wants to know, do, do you think there's going to be any surprises at the Detroit Auto Show? And what are you looking forward to see there? Well, you know, there's some people who thought that Chrysler might come with a surprise because they don't have anything that they're... I don't think there's any surprises at Chrysler this year, unfortunately. Uh, there's been some discussion, as we mentioned earlier, that, that Ford might try and uh, undercut the GM's launch of the new GMC Sierra and Chevrolet Silverado with some manner of concept pickup truck. That's, that's a very real possibility, I think. Um, other than that, I, th I don't think that there will be uh, too many things we haven't done. Somebody always has a surprise. Somebody always pull something nice out but Peter anything that uh, you're looking for or any surprises no I, I hope there is a, I hope there are surprises yeah we talked about the Corvette I, I know uh, I'm pretty we, sure I, I mean know. we just talked about we hope there are surprises yeah, yeah right something yeah, yeah, that yeah. we haven't yeah. read about yeah. te been teased about been telegraphed about just something you yeah. know I'd like to see it Ford I think is showing the or Lincoln I should say is showing the the crossover uh, for Lincoln the concept the concept so that and Anthony anything you're on the lookout for there Well I was looking at the uh, the, the the vehicles that are coming out in the, the concepts and the production models you know what I think is interesting is just the number of products that are available from BMW and Mercedes uh, we were looking at the numbers just before the show to see who actually won that that race and and uh, if um, if Mercedes was sandbagging with their press release earlier where they conceded the uh, the crown to BMW, BMW ended up winning, I think, by 7,000 units uh, for 2012. I don't know if it was that many, but so, but they were definitely ahead of Mercedes. Close. It was close. But I think it's interesting is that the, the, the European brands, luxury brands in particular, are bringing so many products in, the, in that they see Detroit as, as a platform uh, to launch those products. They brought yeah. the, B, the 3 Series, they launched it in Detroit uh, with the last gener you know, the current generation, and so we're seeing a number of luxury models that are coming out in Detroit this time as well. I still think they should change the name of the auto show, but that's just me. Yeah. Let's see. S2000 Moose says, the Ford Focus observed mileage came in way behind the EPA estimates in Cars.com's comparison test last week, more so than the others that were tested. With that added to the Ford hybrid mileage miss, does Ford have a Hyundai Kia problem potentially? Okay. I'll jump in. I don't think so. I think Hyundai Kia got caught. I, I got to be careful how I say this because uh, it seems that they gave data to the EPA that was erroneous. Hyundai Kia did. In the Ford case, I think this is just uh, a problem with the EPA test, yeah. especially when it comes to hybrids, the latest generation hybrids with lithium-ion batteries, because they're able to get through the test largely relying on those batteries so they come up with super high numbers and you get in the real world and you just don't see those kinds of numbers so I, i've been saying all along for the last month now the epa needs to put, add in what i call a fudge factor an adjustment to bring those numbers more in line with what you're going to get in the real world well I, I guess i'd like to test you guys that kind of pile on this question you know do in I have my own opinion, but I would like to get yours, take advantage of this opportunity. Do you think that the government will continue to have a larger role in the industry? We've seen it with, uh, with the EPA ruling. We saw it recently with uh, Toyota uh, being fined for their, how they've handled recalls. Uh, we're seeing other uh, requirements coming up. It was like the rear view mirrors and other things. And I mean, do you, do you see that as, a, as the government well, continuing to play? Sure, the current administration got reelected and they, their agenda is anti-car. And yeah, it will continue. Yeah, I would say uh, the administration uh, is not afraid of growing the size of government, and if that means more regulation, so be it. Uh, I, I think the transportation secretary is making a big mistake mandating backup cameras. Mm -hmm. I don't think they're as safe as using ultrasonic sensors. I don't know why he's fixated on cameras, but I think he wants to leave a legacy. Yeah, well... He's not the smartest tool in the shed, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> right. Either that or he's got bad advice, bad handlers, because he always seems to be sticking his boot in his mouth or whatever. Yeah. Okay, uh, I'll start with you on this one, Ed. Lee from Norman, Oklahoma says, what was the best event that you attended in 2012? The best event in 2012? Automotive-related. Uh, automotive related or <laughs> no nah, it's got to be automotive <laughs> yeah, uh, um, uh, God, 
Anybody else then? Uh, the Formula One race at Austin, in Austin. Yeah. I never thought it would come off. I never thought this facility would be finished. And I never thought I'd, I'd really see $400 million being spent so vividly. Uh, it was spectacular. For me, it was going to the 24 hours of Le Mans. Yeah. You know, that, boyhood dream. You know, went as a guest of Nissan. Boy, they, they brought us first class all the way. It was terrific. Got to get in the pits, in the, in the garage, with the team during the race for a little bit, not a yeah. whole lot. Mm-hmm. It was really cool. That, that was a major It's one event. of the great events. It is. Yeah, uh, any enthusiast who, racing enthusiast, should, should try to get to that. I guess my response would be a little more nerdy. Uh, mine would be the, uh, it was, have to say, North American International Auto Show would have to be, because it wasn't long ago where it was such a sparse show, and in many cases it was cars and carpets. And, uh, you know, just the exhibits, and they were spending money again, I would have to say that. There was a feeling of uh, relief, I think, in the show. Okay, Ray Schaffer wants to know, does anyone on the panel believe that Jaguar ever had any intention of building the CX-75 super exotic uh, concept car, or was it a PR play all along? I, I thought it was a PR play. I never thought we'd see that, that would see the light of day, ever. Well, you were right, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Especially with those micro-turbine engines in it, which I thought was the coolest part of the car. The car is beautiful. Yeah, cool idea. Cool idea. But, you know, obviously they were already working on the F-type or, you know, conceiving yeah. of yeah. the F-type. You know, we, we might dump on them a little bit now for all of that and call it a PR move and all that, but that's the way concept used to be in the old days. No, you're you right, know? Ed. You're right. You, you know, concepts have changed now. You bring out something, you test it, you show it. And then you refine it a little, and, and yeah, it, no, I like the concept. I never thought they'd, but you're right, Ed. I mean, in, in the glory days, they'd show concepts. You'd go to the auto show to say to get, gee whiz, Dad, look at that. You know, like what was that the the car that Ford brought out that became the Batmobile, and you know the Firebirds one, two, and three. You know, yeah. the Jet Age comes to the automobile. Oh, dream car. Yeah, I mean that was part. That was what going to an auto show was, and that's what concept cars were. That went away a long time ago yeah. because of ROI. Oh, you know the bean counters. <laughs> I, think <they're, laughs> I think there's still room, and that's one of the things that we talk about: the excitement. We yeah. want somebody to. To, to, to pull the uh, drape off the car, and we want to be excited and impressed. Yeah. And I think something. Lexus did it a little bit last year in Detroit with the, uh, oh, I don't know if you remember, it's like alphabet soup. With the, uh, LFA? The, the, LF, yeah, the LFA replacement, yeah. They, I mean, that was beautiful. I mean, inside and uh, out. The red, yeah, the, the more production-looking version of the LFA mm-hmm. for Lexus. Yeah, okay. Okay, Sean Childress wants to know, I'm really curious about that one-liter Ford Fiesta. Can you guys guess the MPG? North of 40 highway. I think, I think it's going to be strong. Safe, that might be 50. That's an excellent engine. It is. I, I dr- got to drive it a little bit in L.A. And, uh, and uh, like I've said before, I, I want to get with and do a, a motorcycle with that motor. <laughs> <laughs> you know, are we talking, I, I know, what, are we talking the uh, e, the EPA highway number? Are we yeah. talking, talking about real world. the way Peter would drive it from... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it'll still get close to 40, even with Peter driving it. <laughs> you know, I had a Fiesta for over a year, uh, uh, mm-hmm. a new one, and uh, I drove it pretty hard. And it got, for me, I thought it got great mileage. I mean, I'd hammer it and would get 36 per tank. Wow. Wow. But so I thought yeah. that. Was, so I expect that three cylinder to be good. Yeah, I, I would expect. Of course, uh, I was, you know, rowing those it all little, the way. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's the fun hey, of the little cars. Little cars, you, you sure. have to drive them ten times. Yeah. All the time. Yeah. That's the fun, no question. Uh, let's see. Ray Schaffer shot in another one. He says, "What do you know of the upcoming Cadillac ELR reveal? Will it be a concept car that lives up to expectations once it's in production?" unlike the SSR Aztec that you mentioned earlier. Well, I think they're going to show the production version in Detroit. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah they will. I think it's going to be pretty uh, hot. It's drop-dead gorgeous. Yeah. It's drop-dead. Well, commercial success, I mean, is going to be, how do you measure commercial success in a vehicle like this, an electric vehicle or a hybrid vehicle? You know what I mean? It's going to be a, a, a challenge, you know. So. Well, it's, it's how many of the Hollywood types are seen in it. Right. Well, you know what? I, I think it actually has a higher chance of success than the Volt because, you know, Volt is a car for every man, and it was too pricey for every man. Uh, well, some would argue that the ELR should have come first. Mm-hmm. Well, I, maybe. 
And but, then, you know, they, 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 they wanted to get that car out there. It, there were political reasons and all oh, sorts yeah. of other reasons for doing the vote first. But, you know, at, at the upper end, people are willing to pay a lot of dough for... Uh, you know, again, design. Okay, so it's got the, the development of the Volt, uh, you know, platform underneath it, but design will sell that. Right, right. Uh, and, and I'm blanking out. Help me. Who's the guy who's running Cadillac in the U.S.? Oh, why am I blanking out? The new guy? No, not the new guy. Oh, uh, yeah. I'm okay. Dang, 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 my brain. Butler? Anyway, but, yeah, Butler, Don Butler, mm -hmm. thank you. But anyway, it, it, to, to your point, Anthony, that's what he said. People are not going to come in and buy this car because it's an electric car. They're, they're going to come in and buy it because it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. But do you remember the the uh, concept or the prototype of the Volt that was shown in Detroit? Totally different. Yeah. Right. Yes, indeed. Right. But the ELR. I don't expect is, the ELR, the ELR yeah, it, is going to be. Car. Yeah, it's going to uh, be. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it. it uh, I have it on good authority. <laughs> There's going to be only some minor, minor things, you know, door handles and bumpers and... Well, the sort of stuff you always have to do to get the car into yeah, production. Yeah, right. Okay, Kevin McHale says, I love, uh, do love tuning in every day for what's up in the automotive world, but I've been noticing your anti-union bias escalating in recent weeks. Are unions perfect? No. But without them, workers in our great country would be screwed. The non-union worker also benefits by unions because as the union worker wages go up, the non-union worker keeps pace. What kind of compromise could we come to that gets rid of union corruption but also protects the American worker? I think we're seeing it with right-to-work laws, you know, where you don't have to join a union if you don't want to. And I, I think the long-term effect of that, especially in the state of Michigan, home to the UAW, is it's going to have to become much more responsive to what all its members want. You know, if, if you got to join the club and don't have a choice and it's by law, the club can do whatever it wants. Mm -hmm. If you can drop out and not have to pay them dues, they better be there for you. So I, I, I'm troubled to an extent by this right to work stuff because the last thing we need is more management labor fighting. But I do believe it is going to force unions to begin a whole lot more honest and responsive to their members. And that's my view. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if we got one more. Uh, Swivel Bucket Seat says, okay, so how does VW employ so many people and keep going? Oh, uh, that- uh, if They are doing a master uh, job of their, their architecture, uh, and, part sharing and sharing and able to put not only different hats on these these structures but clearly delineate their brands in the market in such a way we have not seen since the heyday of General Motors. And right. they have 47 brands now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they employ a lot of workers, but they are making money hand over fist. And Peter, they haven't realized the full benefit of that yet. Uh, yeah, that, 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 that's the, uh, that MQB platform. Yeah, that's just getting the, into the, in, in, the, the modular platform. Yeah. Right. Well, you know, the, the key is their bu business structure. You know, as we've talked about on the show before, each and every one of those brands is run as a standalone company. It has its own board of directors, its own annual report. Uh, in the case of Audi, they even have their own stock. Uh, and so everybody, just using Audi as an example, lives, breathes, and dies Audi. Mm -hmm. It's not like a collection of parts and styling does its thing to make it the Audi brand. No, it's it's done by this company called Audi. To the point that Dr. Piech said that, you know, Porsche and Audi can run at Le Mans in 2014 for the overall win. He could have said, no, Audi, you've done it, sit down. We're going to let Porsche. And see, that would have been the MBA, let's go for efficiency, let's not yeah. spend dollars against each other. It makes more logic to have one of the brands race at Le Mans. No, he's like, no, go slug it out, boys. Yeah. Let's and, see who's best. And that's exactly, we talked about General Motors, the General Motors model of success when its brands it were divisions that were run as companies onto themselves, at one point even their own manufacturing facilities and they competed against each other and that's when the company was successful. Yeah. When my GM was great. Pontiac Motors. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so in fact my, my remedy for Lincoln and Cadillac, 
break them off as standalone companies. Well, I think, with, or at least divisions. Well, is Lincoln is, is trying to move in that direction now, and as is Cadillac. You know, we talk about the change in leadership at, at Cadillac, and they're going to have a more global. We've heard this before. Oh yeah, you know? no, no, they, centralized, they, decentralized. Yeah, centralized. they, they, yeah, they, they go back and forth, and I, I, I do like. Ford's saying the right thing, and I do like them calling it the Lincoln Motor Company. It's gonna but make it a company. It's yeah. going to take time. It, it will take time. But I want the ultimate end goal to be what Volkswagen's doing. Mm -hmm. You know, they have way more people than anybody. Any efficiency expert would look at Volkswagen and say, oh, look how many employees per vehicle that needs to, to be manufactured. They're a basket case. Oh, look at the revenue per employee. They're so inefficient. Well, yeah, but they, only, they make more money than anybody in the world. So, but are they settled with the legacy costs, though, that uh, the likes of a General Motors had prior to its what? bankruptcy? You know, I mean, German labor costs are just as high as the old UAW high, costs, higher, or higher. Mm -hmm. But exactly. the point is, is when I say VW AG has 550,000 employees, I'm talking about globally. globally. Yeah. They have about 100,000 in Germany. So they're spread all over the world. And you know, when you look at what's in Germany and what gets built and sold there, it's at the top end of the lineup. So the stuff with the biggest profit margin is what gets built in Germany. And, you know, the cheap stuff is going to Mexico, Brazil, and China, and other places. But I, I still think, vo watch what Volkswagen's doing. I think they're only going to pull away from the pack in the years ahead. Yeah, I would agree with that. And, uh, you know, the, we, we actually, those are the one of the manufacturers we're watching this year as well. They, they did well in 2012, and they'll likely do well in 13 as well. as well, they the profits. Well, they, they're, they're on track. Uh, their best year in the United States was 1970 when they sold 570,000 vehicles. If their growth continues at the pace that it has been this year, they'll surpass that record, you know. But I, their goal was to sell 800,000 units by 2018, I believe, is what they stated right. most recently. So we don't think they'll hit that target. I don't uh, think they'll hit that. So they may not, but it's a stretch target. Mm -hmm. And they increased sales more than anybody else on a percentage basis in 2012 in the U.S. market. They were up I mean, over 30%. Yeah, 430 thousand units I believe is in that neighborhood so. so you know you put the goal out there and even if you fall short man you're still way ahead of where you were well I wrote about the perfect example of where the profits are is I drove a ninety four thousand dollar Audi s7 mm. which you know is really an s or a6 in a zoot suit and a lot of stuff <laughs> And one reader pointed out, I said, well, yeah, you could even stretch the fact that it started out as an A4 somewhere down the way. So, I mean, 94000 I mean, the profit on that S7's got to be staggering. Huge, huge. And Audi generates a lot of the profits. Yeah. A huge chunk of the profits mm -hmm. at VW AG. Yes. Hey, guys, let's wrap it up. This has been a great discussion. Anthony Pratt, thanks so much for coming Thank you, on. Thanks for yeah, me. Really, really interesting, really good. Ed, awesome right. having you thanks, here. Ed, really good. for really. Being, being on. And Peter, good seeing you, man. Yeah, John, another year. Yeah. <laughs> Finish one up and start the next one right away. Keep getting away with it. Huh? Yeah, funny how that. <laughs> that's cool. And we want to thank everybody that's tuned in. Remember, if you're traveling, you can always get the podcast version of this show at the iTunes sh store. It's free. Just look for AutoLine After Hours. You can follow us at Facebook, facebook.com slash AutoLine Detroit, twitter.com slash AutoLine. You can follow all of Ed's stuff at, or Ed's stuff, Peter's stuff at twitter.com slash auto extremist. Oh, no, it's Twitter, uh, Peter M. DiLorenzo now. Oh, okay. Well, I'm glad we brought that up then. Yeah. I think Peter, well, twitter.com slash. Well, yeah, it's Peter M. DiLorenzo. I. Uh, most people know it now, so it's been that way for like six months. Okay, good deal. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone. Your journey, our passion. Visit our website, autoline.tv, where you can watch us live Thursday nights at 6 p.m. Eastern. Get your daily news fix with AutoLine Daily and in-depth analysis and interviews with AutoLine This Week. There's all that and much more at AutoLine.tv.